Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce the. Um, are you ready? <laughs> okay, my pleasure to introduce our second speaker this morning, also from Oxford, um, Tessa Baker, who's going to talk about a, about a dog's test of gravity. All right, thank you very much. So uh, now for something completely different. Um, so as mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm Tessa. I'm also from Oxford. I belong to the astrophysics department there. So I'm a cosmologist by, by trade. I'm going to tell you about one of my key research projects, which is developing agnostic tools for testing the nature of gravity. Now, if the precise meaning of those words is a little bit fuzzy to you at the moment, uh, don't worry, I will explain as we go along what I actually mean by that. Um, I need to put out a big uh, disclaimer here. Um, I have no philosophical training whatsoever, so I am going to stick purely to the cosmology and rely on the uh, assembled expertise to provide the philosophical discussion. Okay, um, so just to comment briefly on how I fit in with the themes of this conference on the conference website. Uh, the headline was that there are two main themes here, space-time emergence, which we heard uh, a lot of interesting talks on yesterday, and alternatives to GR. So I am moving us on to that latter, uh, latter theme. And essentially all my work is about asking the question, how sure are we that Einstein's theory of general relativity is the fully correct classical description of gravity in all environments and on all distant scales in the universe. Now, I'm actually not going to spend very much time motivating why it is uh, we are interested in asking that question, because I think the motivation here is well known, or hopefully is well known to most people in this room. Um, but in brief, why talk about gravity theories beyond general relativity? I think you all know of uh, the sort of pra practical reason, the data-driven reason behind this work. So you're aware that around about the turn of the century, we learned that the expansion rate of our universe is accelerating. And uh, the canonical explanation for that uh, is a cosmological constant. But hopefully you know that itself, the cosmological constant, comes with um, some quite serious theoretical issues. And so there is this question that's being asked, could corrections, extensions to Einstein's theory of relativity uh, explain why it is our universe is accelerating? Could they either give meaning to the bizarre value of the cosmological constant we observe, or could they perhaps replace it? Could they give us something which looks and acts like a cosmological constant, at least over the range of times and scales uh, that our observational data is coming from, even if it's not actually a true cosmological constant? So that's the very um, pragmatic way of motivating this. If you don't like that, if you're totally happy with the cosmological constant, that's fine. Um, instead, then, let me point out that the distant scales over which cosmology operates as a discipline are 16 orders of magnitude larger than the scales over which we have precision tests of gravity. So when I say precision tests of gravity, I mean things like laboratory experiments, um, solar system experiments that have been done by satellites <coughs> flying near the sun, uh, binary pulsar data, all those things that confirm the predictions of GR to incredible accuracy all happen on much, much smaller length scales than cosmology. So if we're going to extrapolate and apply GR to the universe as a whole, that's an assumption we really ought to test. And in order to test it, we need to have a sensible description of what non-GR theories of gravity might look like. OK, so that's why I am here in the first place. Um, so what I'm going to do in this talk, uh, essentially three sections. 
First of all, I am going to give you an overview of this space of alternatives to GR that have been constructed, injected into the literature over the past 17 or 18 years. So this is the realm of modified gravity models. And I'm going to focus on modern work. I know there are some historical models of gravity from the 60s or 70s. I'm going to stick to the, the latest stuff. Um, and that is going to motivate us, uh, as you will see, to develop these agnostic frameworks for testing this landscape of gravity models. So I'll tell you about those conceptually, and then I will introduce you to uh, one specific framework, uh, surprisingly the one I and my collaborators developed, and we'll meet that at a mathematical level. So we'll go through some technical stuff there. If you're not interested in the technical detail, um, I beg you, don't give up on me. Basically, what will emerge from the technical stuff is a set of parameters we want to measure. And so in the final section, I will tell you about what the current and future data <coughs> cosmological experiments can say about these parameters and how well we might be able to measure them in the next 10 years or so. OK, so that is what we are going to do. So let's start with the overview of this space of gravity theories. So if you want to build a modified gravity theory, there is a very useful theorem for you, something called Lovelock's theorem. And there are various statements that can be found in the literature. I quite like the one from Tim Clifton's big review on modified gravity. And the, the Clifton statement is as follows that the only second order local gravitational field equations that you can derive from an action that is built only from the four dimensional metric of space time are those of the Einstein field equations with a possible cosmological constant term. Okay, so what Lovelock is telling you is if you want to build a gravity theory that is not GR, you have to break one of the clauses implicit in the statement of this theorem. And you've essentially got five options there. So what I'm going to do is run through those five options, the five categories of theories. And in the center of the slide here, I will show you a sort of cartoon example of the action of an action from each family. Okay, so we are starting, of course, with the familiar Einstein-Hilbert action for general relativity. So your first option is to give up the part of Lovelock's theorem that says your gravitational action is built only from the metric tensor. And what that means is that you start adding new field content that is coupled to the Einstein-Hilbert action and is involved in mediating gravitational forces. So you can add scalar fields, you can add vector fields, you can even add second tensor fields, or if you're feeling really masochistic, add combinations of them. I am just showing here a very simple example of a scalar tensor theory. So I've got this scalar field phi couples to my Einstein-Hilbert term, comes in with some kinetic term controlled by that function omega, and there's a potential term here. And I could cook up a potential that would give me a universe that accelerates at late times. It's a, a dark energy-like candidate. Um, so this is just a very simple thing. There are much more sophisticated versions in the literature. Hi. So you are assuming that it is a density. You're assuming that all the modifications have the square root of g there. So it's, there's also some covariance assumption right, in the action. Sure. I want to write down a covariant action. Yeah. Yes, which means that you're assuming that the gauge invariance is diffeomorphic. So I'm assuming. You're assuming the gauge invariance is diffeomorphic. Yes. Right. Okay, that's a big assumption. The space time diffeomorphism. We are going to assume, yeah, I will talk about that a lot later. I am going to assume diffeomorphism invariance. Okay, that's not an interesting statement. Yeah. Uh, if K, I mean, so this is. So if I break diffeomorphism invariance, I break coordinate invariance in my theory, right? Let's just find that diffeomorphism invariance. Are the two not very closely related? Not always. Okay. Mm. You're probably right. 
probably going to ask more questions later then. <laughs> Maybe you can tell me more about the difference later from the kind of perspective I'm pursuing. Anyway, it's important than Okay. All right. We are going to assume linear different variants. Um, so my second category of uh, theories is to give up the part of Lovelock's theorem that says we're in four dimensions. So if you want to motivate that from string theory or various brain world paradigms where we're existing on a four-dimensional membrane in some higher dimensional bulk, you can do that. You write down your gravity theory in your higher dimensional space time and you work out what your effective 4D theory is. And that can be different from general relativity. In the case of the brain world examples, you can have brain bending modes that appear as extra degrees of freedom in your theory. You can also write down things like, uh, I'm just showing here the gauss bonnet term. It's a geometric quantity which becomes um, irrelevant in four dimensions, but becomes uh, significant in higher dimensions. Your third option is a little bit more of a mathematical parlor trick. So you can build yourself a higher order theory. And what that means is a theory whose field equations contain greater than a second order time derivative. So again, cartoon example, I've got two derivatives here acting on the Ricci scalar, which itself contains two derivatives of the metric. So this is a fourth order theory. Now, generally, higher order theories spell trouble, okay, because they suffer from something called the Ostrogradsky instability, which means they have Hamiltonians that are unbounded from below. That means they can give rise to pathologies such as spontaneous vacuum decay. Okay, so generally they're sick. However, there are some special cases, the famous F of R gravity being one. There are a few exceptions in which you can build a theory that is higher order and stable. So if you can find one of those special cases, you can write down a theory which is different from general relativity. Option number four is to give up the part of Lovelock's theorem that says your field equations are local. Okay, so at the most basic level, that means you've got things like a, this inverse down version, a non-local operator, appearing in your action and in your field equations. Now, when you say non-local, kind of brings to mind all sorts of bad things, right? You might start thinking about violations of causality, superluminality, tachyons, etc. Okay, the good news is you don't have to suffer those sicknesses. Um, there's been a series of papers over the past few years uh, by a group at Geneva, uh, Michel Maggiore's group, uh, and they've worked out essentially the conditions to include non-local operators and avoid the kind of pathologies I just mentioned. So you can do that. The tricky part is then you have to justify why it is you've chosen to write down this action with a very funny operator in it. And at this point, the, the Maggiore group are a little bit more standoffish. They kind of make a few slightly flaky statements about um, coarse graining, some microscopic theory over uh, finite regions of space-time. I'm not going to try and defend it because I'm not the author of this model, but um, maybe someone here working on the space-time emergence pictures has an idea of you know, motivation for that kind of operator. And your final um, category of theories is to uh, question this part of Lovelock's theorem that say your field equations are derived from an action. And what that really means is derived from an action in the usual standard Lagrangian Hamiltonian way. So could it be that gravity is a special case? It's subject to um, some kind of modified action principle. Now, usually when I give this talk to a cosmology audience, I'm allowed to sort of wave my hands again at this point and make some statements actually about space-time emergence and, you know, rethinking our, our fundamental notion of gravity. Ironically, this audience, I can't get away with being quite so vague, but um, I think probably a lot of the work we heard about yesterday would fall into this category. be interested to know what the people who spoke yesterday think about that. So I like to use these five options to draw myself a map 
for a family tree of all the work in modified gravity that has happened uh, over the recent years. Okay, so I tried to do this one rainy day, um, and this is what I came up with. Okay, so what I've got here uh, in red are those five categories I just introduced, and everything around them is either a subdivision or in black is the name of a theory that you can find on archive. Okay, so this is not complete either, by the way. Right? There are more theories I haven't shown here. And this theory space continues to grow. So, so this is the problem. We have all these theories of gravity that get injected into the literature. And this theory space keeps growing unchecked, largely. Most of the theories on here have not been subject to rigorous, um, rigorous testing of their predictions against the data. And so they sort of persist in the literature and, and don't really get ruled out. And the reason for that is that testing a theory is actually a huge amount of work. To work out what one of these theories predicts for the cosmic microwave background, gravitational lensing, the large-scale structure of the universe, and then to find someone who is familiar with all the latest data sets from cosmological experiments, has the skills to do you know, the necessary Bayesian analyses of the data, constrain the parameters of the theory. It's a lot of work. And so most of the time, it, it doesn't happen. So that's why um, I and my collaborators started thinking about these so-called agnostic methods that is, ways which allow you to test, hopefully, this entire space of theories, or at least most of it, within a single framework. Okay. So, conceptually, or in cartoon format, the idea looks like this. You have that big space of theories I just showed you. And within that space, certain islands are known and identified and put on archive. But there are also parts of this theory landscape we haven't uncovered yet. I'm sure there are more modified gravity theories out there waiting to be found. And what you want to do is build yourself a parameterization, a mathematical framework, which is, an, which is able to um, encapsulate all the properties and predictions of these modified gravity theories. Okay, if you can do that, you can map these whole space of theories onto that much smaller framework. It's a bit like building yourself a machine with a set of dials. And you say that by twisting and turning those dials to different settings, you're able to recover the predictions and the properties of any particular theory in that landscape. And if you can build that machine, you can then just focus on testing this parameterization with the data, constraining the positions of those dials. And you know immediately how to reverse engineer those constraints back onto any particular theory that anyone might care about. Okay, so it's a massively more efficient way of testing this space of theories. And arguably, it's also more agnostic because your parameterization probably contains within it, or is able to access, parts of that theory space that haven't been written down yet. So you might catch a signature in the data that um, has so far been missed by specific models that people are writing down. Okay, so that's the kind of dream here. Um, some of you will know the parameterized post-Newtonian formalism, which is used to test gravity on small scales. Uh, what we're doing here is very similar in spirit to PPN, but it's a cosmological framework. So stage one, which I'm going to tell you about in just a moment, is to construct this parameterization itself. Stage two, which is what I'm working on now, and I'll tell you about at the end of the talk, is to actually marry up this framework to the sea of data we expect from the next generation of, of cosmological surveys that are due to come online over the next 10 years. 
ask what do those data know about this framework? And the hope is to find that the data prefer <coughs> some small but non-trivial region of this parameter space. And then we can work out what that means for that space of theories. We can tell people to focus their efforts on this particular class of gravity theories that are viable and are consistent with the data and essentially stop working on the theories that, that aren't consistent with this. Okay, so that's, you know, that's the goal. What I'm going to do now, section two, is tell you about one particular realisation of this idea. Um, it's something called the effective field theory of cosmological perturbations. Bit of a mouthful, um, but it's the framework that I and my collaborators have, have developed for doing this. And it's inspired, as you can probably guess, by effective field theory, EFT, techniques that are used in particle physics. So what do you do in an EFT? You write down the most general action you can to describe your system that is consistent with certain symmetries, certain physical principles. Okay. Um, the statement that is often sort of made is if a particular term is allowed by your symmetries, you have to write it down, you have to include it in your theory. So we're going to employ that kind of um, approach. And the first thing to do is to determine our set of building blocks that are relevant to constructing modified gravity theories. So we are going to keep the notion of uh, a metric, okay, and we are going to further allow to appear extra fields. As I referred to earlier, generally a lot of these modified gravity theories have extra field content appearing in them. So we'll write down a scalar, a vector, and a second tensor field, and we'll lump this whole set of building blocks for convenience into a vector I will call theta. Now, I'm a cosmologist, so what I want is a description, a very general description, of cosmological perturbation theory. That is the framework I need to calculate predictions for observables, things like the cosmic microwave background. So I need a way of getting at the cosmological perturbation theory uh, that are, um, of this, this building box. So what we do is we are going to assume that there is some true Lagrangian of gravity that we don't know, L, and we're going to do a Taylor expansion of that Lagrangian in linear perturbations, small fluctuations, of my building blocks in theta. Okay, so here we are. This is just a, a Taylor expansion. Everyone can cope with that. So um, I'm just using the standard notation here for derivatives. And the part of this expansion I actually want to focus on is the quadratic term here. Okay, the piece that contains two fluctuations of my building blocks. And the reason being, when I vary my action, it's this quadratic piece that gives me the linearized, i.e. linear in perturbations, gravitational field equations. And those are the things I need to do in my calculation. So this is the guy we want. Um, it looks quite nice and simple here, but actually the devil is in the detail. Of course, there is a sum here, a double sum, hiding in the indices. And so what I'm going to do now is expand out all the terms that are hiding in here. So this is basically going to be an exercise in combinatorics. I've got to work out all possible ways of combining two of my building block fields. Okay, so here we go. Can I ask a brief question? Yeah. What are you assuming about the extra fields? Um, what am I assuming about them? Uh, what do you mean exactly? Well, you, you have the theta vector, which mm -hmm. contains the metric and something else. Yeah. What are you assuming about something else? Okay, so the example I'm going to write down on my slides now, I'm going to assume that something else is just a scalar field. That is only for simplicity. I could. I could assume there is a vector field, I could assume all three are present, the expressions just get longer and longer. So we're going to assume it's a scalar for now. 
And are you assuming that it's on a solution so that the first derivative is zero? Assuming it's on a solution to the so first derivative is zero. No, I'm not assuming solution of this theory at any point yet. I'm going to include derivatives of my scalar. I'm going to write up to second order derivatives of my scalar. Well, I'm you know the linear transform in the convergence? No, no, I meant that the, 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 it's on a solution in the sense that it's a perturbation on a solution. So the, the, the first the variation. We're well, not talking those. about solutions here. If I'm interpreting your question correctly, you're saying, you know, a solution of my theory will be like the, the Schwarzschild solution or like whatever the modified Schwarzschild right. solution is in this theory. I'm not specializing to a solution yet. I'm just writing down a general Lagrangian for these fields. So it's not expanding about a, a solution, some solution. That's my question. Because otherwise, the first term is not that. I got it. Okay, so I guess I'm expanding about a cosmological background. That's what you mean. Yes. Yeah. Okay, all right. So we start writing down these quadratic terms. So first up, you have to include things like this. This is coupling together two linear perturbations of my metric, in this case, the spatial part of the metric. Also, we've got you know, the time-space parts of the metric, the time-time parts of the metric, and I can put in spatial derivatives, I can put in time-like derivatives. <coughs> so I work out the whole set of terms I can write down just involving the metric. Then I start bringing in these extra fields that I talked about. So I said we were going to talk about the scalar field in particular. So I've got this kind of term, which looks a bit like a kinetic term for my scalar. And then I start coupling everything together. So this is a term which links together my scalar field and uh, the Ricci scalar, which of course is something you form from the metric. So you write down all such terms. I'm not writing them all down here, because even in the simplest case, you get about 70 terms. If you start working with the, the vectors and, and the second tensor fields as well, things get up to about 100 or so terms. So this is a big beast of an expression. And we're going to assume there is the usual um, standard model matter sector going on here. So we've got baryons, neutrinos, cold dark matter, etc., all coupled to this. And every term in this expansion comes with a coefficient. They actually came from that Taylor expansion we did. So I'm trying to use sort of informative subscripts here. Every term here has a coefficient, actually a function of time, controlling its amplitude. OK, so at first sight, this appears horrendous. I've written you down this very general action for a gravitational theory, and I've told you it's got 70 unknown terms, sorry, 70 unknown coefficients in it. How am I ever going to make predictions? How am I ever going to constrain that? So there's a question about the green line, the last green line. That contains couplings of usual matter to gravity and usual matter couplings to theta. So, so okay, so, so many terms. Yep, so I'm skipping over details here, but you are absolutely right. I could couple this in the usual way, or I could start bringing in some exotic couplings between my metric and, and various matter species if I wanted to. Okay. So, so I have a question. So what about Laplacian or like higher derivatives? Right, also, okay, good. You guys are picking up all the subtle details that I am kind of glossing over. Um, what you have to do is pick an order in derivatives to truncate at. So generally, people stop at second order. You can go to fourth order if you want. The, you know, the higher you go, the more terms you're going to get. You pick an order that you think is motivated. OK, so you write this thing down, and it's a mess, and it's got all these unknown coefficients in. Okay, but fortunately, we still have the symmetries of the theory to save us. Now, this is going to come back to your earlier point, so maybe uh, we can talk about this later. But I'm going to assume that this action has to be coordinate invariant, right? Coordinates don't mean anything. They're just a choice of an observer. Uh, they can't affect the physics. And for my purposes today, coordinate invariance is synonymous with linear diffeomorphism invariance. So I require that this whole action I've written down obeys a linear diff symmetry. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to make a change of coordinates. We're going to shift by this four vector 
um, epsilon mu, which we can break up into a time-like part and a spatial part. And we're going to require the whole action remains invariant under this transformation. So what's going to happen when we do that coordinate shift? Okay, I'm sketching things here because the expressions are large. But essentially, that action we wrote down, I'm calling it delta 2s, shifts to itself, of course, plus a whole extra set of terms that we generated when doing this. And those terms coupled together, things that were linear in our building block fields, the scalar phi and the metric, multiplied by one of these linear diff parameters, pi or the epsilon. So we've got this whole extra set of gubbins that we've generated. And the only way our theory can remain invariant is if all of that vanishes. It has to vanish identically. Um, what's more, it doesn't just have to vanish for solutions of the theory. It actually has to um, vanish for any field configurations. So this is what we call a non-dynamical symmetry. Okay, I'm, I'm not showing this explicitly because it gets very messy, but hiding, okay, if you set everything in here to zero and you require that that happens for any configuration of your fields, what you get out of that is a set of constraint relations that tie together all the coefficients we had in this expression. Literally, you get a set of equations that tell you that three times this coefficient minus five times that coefficient must vanish, or you know, things like that. So you've got a set of, constraint on, set of constraints on this 70 unknown coefficients. And you can solve that. You can eliminate the vast majority of these unknown coefficients. You reduce your system down from having all these unknown coefficients to just a small number. And these small number of coefficients are the true descriptors of your modified gravity theory. Once you've specified them, everything else is determined by the symmetries. These are, if you like, I sort of call them the nuggets of your theory. They are the dials that I referred to earlier with that machine. They are what you map the theory of gravity onto, and they are the things you want to constrain with the, with the data. So they are, are equivalent of the PPN parameters, for those of you who know PPN. OK, so this is showing you how the numbers work out. Um, if you just assume, if you just go through this process with a metric and no other fields, you only get one free coefficient at the end of the day. And to recover general relativity, you identify that coefficient as being the Planck mass. If you go through the example I just showed, where you have an extra field phi, you end up with a set of five coefficients. Five I want to say parameters, they're actually functions, but I might keep calling them parameters. Five parameters which describe any modified gravity theory with this field content, and in this case, up to second order derivatives, something we call the Horndesky family of modified gravity theories. If you include vector fields, things can get a little bit worse. You can get up to nine um, free parameters, um, but that's about as bad as it gets. So what I'm going to do now, and for the rest of uh, my time, is to focus again on this Horndesky class, mainly because it is the most well studied and it's the easiest to talk about. Yes? What did you assume about the discrete symmetries like C, P, P, T? That, that they are all preserved as per normal for GR. Oh, that's called the Alpha huge energy. OK. Maybe you can tell me more about it at the end. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about this Horndesky class here, only because it's the easiest one to talk about for now. And Horndesky has these five parameters to describe it. Okay, so these five parameters are usually called the alphas. And the nice thing about alphas is that they have physical meanings. So there's one parameter, alpha t, again, actually a function of time, um, which describes the speed of propagation of gravitational waves in your theory. So you think about alpha t being less than zero, 
Um, if it's you know, minus 0 0.5 or whatever, you would have gravitational waves that propagate slower than C. Now, obviously, minus 0 0.5 would be an extreme example. But in principle, you can have that effect. Alpha k is something we call the kineticity parameter. And it describes the kinetic term of this new scalar field in our modified gravity theories. So you could have a sort of very simple, regular kinetic term. Or sometimes these theories come with very exotic kinetic terms. That's controlled by this parameter. Alpha b is called the braiding parameter. And it controls how mixed up your scalar field and your metric are. In what ways do they interact and couple? Alpha m, and I think it probably is quite difficult for you to see that one, but that's an alpha with a subscript m, um, is a, the Planck mass run rate parameter. So a lot of these theories, you can get an effective time-evolving Planck mass, time-evolving gravitational constant. And that running is controlled by this parameter. And finally, there's one called alpha h, and I've never figured out why it's called alpha h, which um, describes something called disformal transformations of your, your theory. I don't really want to go into those too much because they're not talked about so much, but some theories have a particular property. You can do something called a disformal transformation, which is like a more exotic cousin of a conformal transformation. Okay, so these are the things we chase after with the data. Um, and just to show you that the system works, uh, here is a table uh, which one of my collaborators compiled where he's got four of these parameters and he's showing you how individual theories of gravity, these are all things that people just wrote down in the literature, map on to these parameters. Okay, so lambda CDM, i.e. general relativity, is the case where all of these alphas are set to zero. And these more exotic theories can be described by turning on various combinations of these parameters in certain ways. OK, so that is the formalism. Uh, as I said, that's stage one of the process. What I'm going to do in my remaining time is give you a flavor of stage two, which I said was to take this formalism to the data, ask how well can we actually measure these alpha parameters, these functions of time? Um, as I said, this is what I'm working on now, so a lot of this is a little bit more um, uh, future pointing, let's say. It's still a work in progress. First of all, note that constraining five functions of time, functions of redshift, is actually quite <laughs> a big ask for current data. If you try and do that with the current data sets we have, you won't get very good constraints at all. You'll get something very weak. Because a lot of these alpha parameters can be played off against each other, they have degeneracies with regard to the data. So we have to use a little bit of common sense to help us out. First of all, um, the alpha k parameter, that was the kineticity, the kinetic term of the scalar field one. Um, really only affects the very largest scales in the universe. I'm not showing this, but if you derive the field equations, essentially on sub-horizon scales, it drops out. So apart from you know, a, a few data sets, it's pretty hard to measure alpha k. So we'll make that our lowest priority. Alpha t, the tensor speed parameter, clearly the data set you want to measure that with is gravitational wave data, which actually is now upon us. Um, but I am not a member of LIGO. And so at the moment, we don't have the, um, the mechanisms in place, the, the data in hand to do that. But maybe in future, when gravitational wave data is routine and, and publicly available, we can actually measure our fatigue. So we're going to focus on two of those parameters, the braiding parameter, alpha b, and the Planck mass run rate, alpha m. These are the easiest two to measure. Now, as I said, measuring functions of time, functions of redshift, is hard. There are ways of doing it, Gaussian process methods, principal component analysis, but they yield quite weak constraints. 
So what I'm going to do today, and I stress this is not a fundamental thing, this is just an ansatz to give you a working example, is I am going to assume that these alpha parameters are proportional to omega lambda, that is the effective energy density in the cosmological constant as a function of redshift. Okay, and this is essentially imposing onto our modified gravity framework the property that it only affects the late time universe. We don't really want to change the early universe here, we're just trying to explain late time acceleration. So we'll assume that time dependence and then the thing we are going to actually measure or constrain are those constants of proportionality. And I will call those C with the relevant subscript. Okay, so there's going to be a CM and a CB. What data do we have to do this? Well, cosmologists typically divide our data into kind of two uh, sets. We've got things which probe the background expansion rate of the universe. And we've got things which probe the dynamics of cosmological perturbations. So background expansion rate of the universe is basically described by the Hubble factor, or sometimes you hear talked about the equation of state of the, the dark energy-like sector, omega of z, the thing that appears as minus one for a cosmological constant. And you know, the thing everyone knows about is the supernovae data, which were the first things to tell us about the accelerating expansion rate of the universe. You can also measure that background expansion rate using um, various strong gravitational lensing systems. From my point of view, actually where the interesting stuff happens is in a whole other set of data that tells you about the dynamics of cosmological perturbations. And for those of you who were here yesterday, this is why I kept asking about uh, perturbations. So it's linear perturbation theory that describes the cosmic microwave background, the large-scale cosmic web of the universe, something we can access via galaxy surveys, um, the weak lensing of galaxies, so the subtle distortions in galaxy shapes that happen as their light travels to us through this cosmic web, and the lensing of the cosmic microwave background itself. These are all um, workhorses of modern cosmology, things we can measure with telescopes and things that we can use to get constraints on those alpha parameters. So here is the current state of play. Okay, so I'm showing you a two-dimensional constraint plot here on that CM and that CB, which were the proxies for the alpha M and the alpha B, the Planck mass run rate and the braiding. Um, so this is current data, this is a real constraint, um, and just to save you reading the numbers off the graph, uh, this is what they, they say essentially at two sigma level. You'll note that actually the CB parameter is uh, very, very, very mildly inconsistent with zero. Please don't get excited by that, it's not a statistically significant measurement at all yet. Okay, so. We have some constraints at the moment, but they're not that strong. They're not strong enough to really start ruling out um, things in that landscape of modified gravity. So what we really need to do is get more data and improve these bounds, try and figure out are these C parameters consistent with zero or not. Exactly. Which data sets were used? Yep. So um, I have it there. So this is the CMB data from Planck and uh, large-scale structure data, growth rate data from Boss, Vipers, and Wiggles. Notably, no gravitational lensing data was done in this analysis. So when you say the axis surveys, do you mean VAOs, uh, or do you mean... Uh... Yeah, so it's basically all the things you get from a galaxy survey. So you get VAOs, you get matter power spectra, you also get F sigma rate, the growth rate, things like that, Redshift space distortions. Okay. So the good news is that we have a set of <coughs> experiments due to come online in the next uh, seven or eight years uh, that will hopefully provide us with much better data to improve these tests of gravity. So the Dark Energy Survey is a ground-based telescope that is actually happening now. So this will be the next experiment to kind of have a big cosmological uh, results release, so do look out for that if you're interested. 
Euclid is a European Space Agency satellite mission. Um, it has a large-scale structure survey. It also has a big, weak gravitational lensing survey. LSST, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, massive ground-based telescope under construction. Uh, when ready, it will survey the entire night sky in just four nights. That is absolutely unprecedented in observational astronomy. And finally, the Square Kilometre Array is uh, the world's largest radio telescope. So it's a network of individual radio dishes, so large it spreads out over two continents. So the centre of the array is actually in Western Australia, and the, um, the dishes, they're not all in place yet, but they spread all the way over to South Africa. Okay, so there's an incredible wealth of data we hope to come. So this is a forecast, i.e. a prediction, not a real constraint, a prediction for what we should be able to do when we have that data in hand. Um, so this is from my colleague David Alonso. He's showing you what happens as you combine these various data sets that I talked about. Galaxy clustering, CMB, weak lensing, intensity mapping is what you get from a, a radio telescope, basically. And of course, the most uh, exciting result here is the red ellipse in the center, where you combine all the data you have. Um, again, I won't sort of you know, try and make you read off the precise numbers here, but the hope is that with that data in hand, we should actually be able to start uh, measuring these parameters well enough to rule out whole patches of that modified gravity landscape and actually make this, this dream work of, of um, testing GR in a very general way. I'm nearly done and I'm nearly out of time, so that's fine. Um, just a brief advert. I, I don't know how relevant that's, this is to anyone in this room, um, but I do have codes, publicly available tools that you can download if this is something that interests you. So for the whole theoretical framework, I've described um, the EFT of cosmological perturbations. There are a set of two mathematica, pack mathematica packages uh, that you can download from this link. They're called Exist and Copper. They work together. And they will step you through this whole framework that I sort of sketched today, where you write down this general action, you enforce the symmetries, it all boils down to these alpha parameters. You can step through that. Um, and we are working on right now um, implementing this framework in a code called High Class, which is an Einstein Boltzmann solver that is the kind of um, workhorse tool of cosmology that you need to calculate things like power spectra of the cosmic microwave background, structure formation, lots of the standard cosmological observables. So there will, will be, hopefully in the next few months, a publicly available version of high class that has this formalism implemented in it. So do look out for that. OK, um, so I'm, I'm pretty much finished. I'm not a fan of lengthy conclusions, but in brief, what have I done? I have shown you Lovelock's theorem as a classification scheme for modified gravity theories. I have introduced you to one of these agnostic frameworks, the EFT of cosmological perturbations, that is a way of mapping all those theories onto a single framework. And I've given you some flavor about how the upcoming data uh, should enable us to measure the parameters of this framework and test the nature of gravity in general. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> and then we're going to invite Simon back up for the broader um, um, panel discussion. Um, okay, Chris, I saw your hand mm. up first. So uh, thanks, gonna go thanks across for the talk. Uh, uh, this is probably just implicit, but in the, in the case of like the PPN formalism, mm. you're basically starting off with a solution and parameterizing around that. And here, I guess the solution is the FLRW model. Yeah, exactly. And then you're parameterizing around the linearized perturbation. Exactly. Is there any worry that you might have alternative gravitational theories that have something that mimics an overall 
FLRW model in such a way that this would be a problematic assumption. So, it, it, you know, the question is if you had a solution that looked like the FLRW model or fit whatever constraints we have, mm -hmm. that you could then try to build a perturbation theory around. Um, so when I, mm, okay, so I'm assuming homogeneity and iso isotropy on a cosmological scale. Right? Yeah. So you, you're right that I can't describe um, a Bianchi universe right. in, in this framework. Right. I'm not too worried about that given current constraints on Bianchi models. I don't particularly feel a, a motivation to describe that. But I'm thinking of one of the modified theories if they have a different kind of solution space than GR. I guess I don't quite understand what, you, what you're thinking of when you talk about a non-FLW solution, right? To me, FLW is a uh, homogeneous and isotropic universe that expands. And, and yeah, that's what all the data point towards. Perhaps I should mention, and I didn't sort of go through this explicitly, as well as the alpha parameters, you also have, um, you have to constrain the Hubble factor as well. So if your universe expands at a slightly different rate from what is predicted mm -hmm. by lambda like CDM, that is contained in the Hubble factor. I'm thinking, so, so just, uh, there, there's these uh, old papers by Wainwright and Ellis doing dynamic systems approach to cosmology, where they consider anisotropic and endogenous models that have long periods where they're quite close to an FLW okay. model. Okay. So then they depart significantly outside some large time scale. Um, and so then you have something that sort of mimics an FLRW model, okay. um, but then the parts, and I'm wondering if... That would not be included. Right, right. Okay, Michaela, next. Sure, that was fabulous. I, I just had a question, I guess, about the methodology, and uh, when I was listening to you, it kind of reminded me of similar um, methodological efforts happening in uh, particle physics, physics at the moment, where the size of the, um, uh, the withering number of alternative to the standard models and the difficulties of uh, checking those with the data, people are exploring uh, uh, kind of more independent approaches um, in the form of simplified models or um, other phenomenological variations of the more specific models. Um, and, and so, I guess my clarifying question that was part of the framework that already presented, um, how does that translate into um, modeling practices of the method? Simplified model, simple model that um, may or may not have I don't know, two parameters. I mean, I guess practical physics, I have a better grasp of what that means in that context. I'm not really sure how that practice may translate in the cosmology or maybe other work. So if I understood correctly, if you have a, an independent theory of cosmological perturbations that give you a set of parameters and those to describe it, and then you can plug in different medical values and you can uh, um, use that as a general framework for assessing those variations. Um, I guess in terms of uh, modeling and simulations and how to translate all that into things that you can have that go to the observation of cosmologists and, and say, okay, some much earlier attempts, <coughs> I was involved in those as well, to come up with um, descriptions of modified gravity models. And they were a lot more ad hoc. Uh, they're a lot simpler, but you ended up sort of just fudging factors into your field equations. And there wasn't so much physical reasoning behind it. And so you ended up with these frameworks that didn't really correspond to physically viable gravity theories. So you were constraining them, but you weren't, it was a bit of a waste of time, if you like. So that led to the whole development of this approach to really understand how to parameterize gravity in a way that only allows physically viable theories to sort of exist within it. So that's one thing. Um, your sort of latter point, how to tie up the observations, um, that's what really what these codes I mentioned at the end are all about. So if you have one of the, like, these Einstein Boltzmann solvers, you can run it with, you know, uh, 10 different realizations of these alpha functions, for example, and they will spit out for you literally power spectra of the cosmic microwave background and say, you know, the third peak of the cosmic microwave background is going to shift 
half a degree to the right or, or something like that. They will tell you what is the straightforward observational implication of what you are doing to your theory of gravity. Um, and that's, that's how you link up with the data. Yeah. Okay, next. Uh, mine is just a more technical question. It's probably something I didn't quite understand. When you were constraining the parameters by using the linearized uh, isomorphisms, um, couldn't you have just t taken that as a condition on the divergence of the stress energy tensor? I mean, usually we translate the isomorphism invariance of the matrix factor as just conservation of the energy momentum tensor. That's what it means. So uh, my question is, if you did you have to go to the second order uh, perturbations to, to find that those correlations? Couldn't you just have done the variation of the, the action by the metric and taken the very derivative of that? Couldn't you have found the same relation? I'm not fully sure I'm understanding. Um, if I had just uh, required conservation of the stress energy tensor, and I'm assuming you mean the effective stress energy tensor of um, all the terms I wrote down. Um, that's just going to give me one relation. Right, where actually, what I got out of this was a set of 65 relations, right, with, to constrain all these parameters. I wonder if this is related to what I mentioned about the dynamical versus non dynamical symmetry. So, if I just require conservation of stress energy, um, if you like, on shell, so we call a, a dynamical symmetry then I only get one or two relations. But the fact that I require it for any field configuration and non-dynamical symmetry is what gives me such a large set of constraints. I'm not sure I've answered your question, but I'm not sure I understood it. So maybe. I have two concerns about theory assessment. And I'm wondering if this can be quite connected to the process to raise these issues. Mm -hmm. One of them is you mentioned the problem of degeneracies, but how bad are they? You introduce a lot of parameters. When you introduce a lot of parameters, the explanatory content may go down. Um, supposing you make a hypothesis that there's a scale of field and you have your five parameters and you measure your five parameters and you discover some dark zero values. Mm -hmm. And somebody else has another hypothesis. Maybe that there's a different gauge symmetry. And they have eight parameters, and they have run that, and they measure value for the eight parameters. And somebody else says, it's neither of those hypotheses. So the initial conditions are different than you thought they were. They have a theory of non-standard non initial conditions that has six parameters, and they vary those six parameters. They pick the data. In the end, we're going to have the problem of assessing those different hypotheses and if I can be provocative, it's not clear that having a lot of parameters, in the face of measuring a lot of parameters, that we're going to be able to assess and contrast and distinguish different competing hypotheses. So first of all, your three different people that you mentioned need to agree to compare the same kind of theory. So I had that table with um, they're all in, they're all in your, your classification. So they're all constraining what I call the Hondesky family? No, no. So you have the Hondesky family. I have the somebody else family. They have the change in the initial right. conditions family. So what I'm saying is they have to all agree to test the same kind of theory. But then we're not testing. Then we're not. Then how are we learning about nature? Well, because we, we're just confirming. Isn't there a problem that if theory, if hypothesis X has enough parameters, will likely be able to match the data for some choice of parameters, even if hypothesis X is false. But actually what this framework does is it places a cap on the number of parameters. Right? So if you write me down a, a very complicated, I don't know, vector field theory that has I don't know, 25 free parameters in it, I'll actually be able to plug it into this formalism and tell you that some of those parameters are redundant. It will come down to actually, in the case of the vector field, it's just nine. But so there is a limit to the number of free parameters needed to describe a, a given family of theories. Does that make sense? Yes, I'm convinced. Uh, the state of the art is. With some assumptions. The state of the art is we don't know if we can 
measure a single parameter, which is whether the cosmological constant is a constant or whether there's a time variable change of the dark energy. It's that measuring that one constant is something that these next generation of detectors are partly designed to do. If you add additional hypotheses, which add additional parameters, it's not clear to me, maybe I'll missing something, that we are going to increase our explanatory power over the consideration of just a single, a single hypothesis with a single I mean, that's what these ellipses are all about, right? This is this, you know, this is how modern cosmology works. Is you look in the Planck constraint papers, you'll get these kind of two-dimensional ellipses that tell you exactly what the degeneracies are. And so, in order to, if you like, make a detection, what you need is good enough data such that this ellipse is. Uh, Okay, first of all, you know, you need to find this ellipse shifted away from its GR value, from its fiducial value, and you find out where the two sigma contours of this ellipse are. And if the two sigma, if, if the GR fiducial value is outside the two sigma contours, then, well, okay, two sigma is not enough, but three sigma, five sigma, whatever, then you say you have a detection of that parameter. No, and that's fabulous, and that's, there's a lot of power in that. But let me mention another real world example, down down Seattle. There are, when people thought there was non Gaussianity in the data, there were competing explanations, some based on modifying the potential in an inflationary model, mm -hmm. some based on modifying the initial conditions. Mm -hmm. There's a degeneracy. Had the data persisted in telling us there was non Gaussianity, we would not have been able to distinguish empirically between these two very different kind of hypotheses. Okay. And So that, that's really my, my concern. I think I'm sure at repeating my statement that the, the kind of beauty of this approach is that it puts a cap. It sets, tells you what those parameters are. You can't just cook up a theory with any parameters you choose. It becomes equivalent to this. Well, it seems like there's two. I mean, Robert's got a, is that a comment directed on this or is it a new yeah, question? Yeah, okay, yeah, well, we'll get Robert I mean, Let me try to rephrase what, what Lee is asking in a different way. So, if the data shows that the standard model is, uh, is fine, then we would have learned something. But I think Lee's concern is if, with a particular parameterization, you find a discrepancy, you, you find that there's evidence for, for, for physics beyond the simplest model. What would we really have done? Because there's a different parameterization which also gives. Right, okay, so sorry, maybe I've misunderstood. So if you find a, a discrepancy with the fiducial values of GR, then you're right that, that, that will be, there will be several, probably, modified gravity models that can fit that. Right? So it will not not match in that theory space, but it's, um, it wouldn't necessarily be a one to one mapping. No, but the point is that we don't even know which patch it maps to. Because the different versions of parameterizations. And given each parameterization will map to a patch. Each but version a, will but parameterization and your parameterization could well, you'll be very different parameters. So you'll both find a patch. But you won't know which the, which is the right patch. So I think what we are suggesting really is let's test a particular idea for modified physics mm -hmm. with the simplest parameterization and let's see if we find out it's a I'm expressing a concern that I think the philosophers have something to say about. I'm advocating a course of action. I would say if these parameterization and my parameterization, different as they may be, are both constructed in the right way, they should map to the same patch. Yeah, but they include different physics. They include different physics. So you different think a, a scalar, uh, like the Hornetsky model versus adding a new tensor field? Well, oh, sure, but, uh, the, but I, I'm sorry if I didn't make this clear enough. You have to consider those cases differently. Right, and that's... Right, so the data might tell you that, you know, uh, yeah, this patch of model space, if it's got one scalar field, but it's this patch of model space right. would have a vector field. Right. Yes, of course, you yeah. know, that absolutely would happen. And at that point, you know, uh, okay, you have to make a judgment call about where to, you know, then invest your time, which you think is most likely. Right. Case. Right. But even that would be a massive improvement over what we have now. Right. Just 
shutting out all these gravity models. We seem to be shifting to a more general discussion. Mm -hmm. Today we'll invite Simon up here for more kind of general panel discussion and then maybe give like people five minutes to stretch their legs. I know, I know you have a degree. Thank you.